This is Viterbi Voices, the podcast, your chance to hear stories about research, classes, student life, and more directly from our faculty, students, and other members of the engineering community here at the University of Southern California. This is episode 110, featuring one of my favorite people on campus, Dr. Jill McNick Gray. She's a professor in the biomedical engineering department and human bio department and runs the USC Biomechanics Lab. Stay tuned for an episode about her wild academic path, her passion for sports and science, and her exciting plans for the upcoming Olympics. Welcome back into Viterbi Voices. This is episode... 110. 110. Uh, Rhea, what's up? Not much. It's Monday morning, bright and early. This is the earliest we've ever done this, isn't it? Yeah, I I honestly felt bad suggesting 9 a.m. Monday morning. When I I got your (laughs) request to do this recording, I was like, (laughs) but I knew we needed to, and I know there was other issues, and I canceled, and I messed up the scheduling in the last one, so I Mm -hmm. apologize. Um, But we did it, and it was cool. Yeah, we did it. I would have never have loved anyone better to record at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning than Jill McNitt Gray. Yeah. Tell us about our our, our, uh, our uh, guest on this episode. Yeah, so Jill, or Dr. McNick Gray, is my research professor, or my research mentor, and she has been for the last four years. But on campus, she's a professor of biomedical engineering, and she's also in the human biology department, um, and she works with athletes, which is really cool. Yeah. So she runs the USC Biomechanics Lab on campus, and we do sports performance research. is like a broad, overarching term, mm-hmm. um, and we basically conduct – like force analysis on athletes and research ways to optimize their movement, reduce risk of injury, and we do that across all sorts of different sports. That's really, really cool. Working with track, working with gym, yeah, gymnasts, gymnasts, working with cross country runners, working mm-hmm. with I know in the past she's worked with volleyball teams, yeah. she's worked with golfers, she's mm-hmm. worked almost with every USC athlete yeah. or team here, yeah. and it's just. It, it, I have known about her work for so long. Mm-hmm. We said the podcast is the first time I've met her because so many of your predecessors, BME students that have worked with me, yeah. have all worked with her mm-hmm. doing cool stuff of mixing sports and analysis with biomedical engineering and, yeah. and math and modeling mm-hmm. and all that cool stuff. And um, it's just, I've always heard really cool things. I've seen yeah. the videos of yeah. like, you know, the motion capture stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really, really cool it's things. It's really awesome. For anyone who's really into sports, this is like, the coolest lab to work in because you use all of the things that you learn in your engineering classes to learn how you can make athletes better. And you do that and you interact with a lot of like the top athletes um, at USC and with uh, yeah. USA track and field and a national level. It's amazing. And, and you learn so much more about sports. You get to hang out with a lot of people that are, love sports. Yeah. Like my lab will go play basketball at lunch. Like we all oh, cool. they play flag football together on the weekends. It's a really great environment. That's awesome. Um, and we all learn together, which is really cool. Very cool. Yeah. yeah the, I, you know, there's so much stuff out there. We talk about in the podcast uh, in this episode um, about wearable technology, mm-hmm. about all these different trackers and devices that are kind of going to help performance or – you know, uh, give you data related to what's going on in your life. We talk a lot about that and how that's mm-hmm. different than some of the work that she's doing. Mm-hmm. Talk about her work with Olympic teams and um, I, I guess USA Track and Field is a, is a big one over yeah, the last recent that's a big Olympics. One. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, there's not anything we could say to really kind of give this justice <laughs> other than to hand it off to her and uh, learn a little bit more about biomechanics and Dr. Jill McNitt Gray. So, uh, you know, it's funny, Joe, I ha- I've seen your name, I've written your name, we've never met multiple uh-huh. times, but you have worked with so many of my students in the uh-huh. past, Rhea being the most recent, uh-huh. but even go back to Claire Christian okay. and Nick Wegner, I think oh, Adam, I think Adam Anderson oh, might have yeah. worked with you as well. <laughs> like, those are all students that have worked with me in this same role, not podcasting yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I feel like I think there's even more than that 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 have all worked in your so lab. So keep in touch with them. That's always yeah. the fun part. Yeah, absolutely. So what's Nick Wagner doing? Nick is a orthopedist in uh, Nebraska, uh-huh. in Omaha, in Nebraska. Nebraska. Wow. Oh, no he way. went back home. Yeah, he and his oh, wife. That's so cool. And they have two. Wife. They have two. Wait a second. I have to take all this. In. They have two lovely children. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm a keynote speaker at the meeting in Omaha this May, so I'm kind of we you have his contact information. I do. That would be great. I do. Yeah. I will. I will give it to you. That yeah. would be great. He's doing some cool stuff, and he, he's out. He's out here pretty frequently because his wife is from Orange County, and oh, so okay. they they come hang out with the grandparents every once in a while. But, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So yeah, there's so many students that go back to to, right. to you, so that they overlap. So your lab is incredibly popular with our biomedical engineers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great it's lab. Really fun. I mean, it's, you know, you see a lot of people come. Yeah. A new crop coming through mm-hmm. too, so it's really. 
That's great. Very cool. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you you've been at the university for quite some time, right? right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, wh- well, where did you where did you get started in where this did whole I get process? Started? Yeah, yeah. Where'd you go to undergrad? Oh, okay, so let's see. I've been here since at USC since 1988, mm-hmm. and I went to Miami University in Ohio. Right. But I grew up in upstate New York. So I was looking for a school that let me do a lot of things that I was interested in. Okay. And um, so I was good at math, so that was nice. I liked math. I still like math. Um, and But I could also play sports. Now, this is – I'm dating myself here, but um, the women weren't even in the NCAA. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll just have a moment there, all right? Uh-huh. <laughs> in, in my lifetime, right? Mm-hmm. And Title IX had just come through. And um, so I was playing field hockey and doing competing for gymnastics for Miami University in Ohio. Hmm. And it's the cradle of coaches, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, so I was doing that. And, uh, you know, it's a balancing act. You're, you're taking math courses. You're trying to, you know, know your content and classes. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're spending time outside, which mm-hmm. I think is a really good bent, uh, balance for me personally is to have the sports and to have the, the math part. And um, – What's really interesting about that is like, oh, I don't know, maybe I need to cut back. And then uh, we got a new coach, and that made all the difference. Mm-hmm. And um, and they actually awarded me a grant and aid my second year, which was like wow. pretty revolutionary that women yeah. would actually have support for school through their participation in sport. That's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah, so it went great. And then I had, was very fortunate to have great coaches along the way. And I'm like, you know, I'm studying this math thing, but really like – what, I don't even know what it was called back then, but basically what's human biology now. Got it. So can I create my own coaching certification? <laughs> and they, <laughs> my coaches were like, okay, well, what would that look like? And so I put it together, and it's basically what our human biology major is now. So mm-hmm. it's like a combination of math and a human biology degree. So it was athletic training, motor control, physiology, biomechanics, um, coaches administration, you know, so all of those things. And I, I think I might be the first and last person to get a coaching certification from Miami <laughs> University. The first and last. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But it's the cradle of coaches. A lot of really top coaches have right. come out of Miami for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but I was able to get that degree along with my math degree, and I was able to add the math and the stats together. So hmm. that put me – my next stop was doing load research, load management for American Electric Power Corporation – yeah, and you're like, what? Wow. <laughs> How did we get there? The funny part is you made it sound like, so naturally my next step was. <laughs> and I was like, how, how did that happen? I thought we were going on to like your graduate degree. Nope. <laughs> no, no, we had to work for a while, right? <laughs> but it was really interesting. It was the time when there was alternative energy mm-hmm. uh, mandates for mm-hmm. the power corporations to figure out how you could reduce peak load, yeah. which is really ironic because I look at reducing peak load in people now, yeah. but this was in the whole power grid system. So if you could get people to not turn the air conditioning all on at the same time when they right. get home, then you could actually reduce the peak load and would not have to build as many power plants to meet need and things. So mm-hmm. we actually had sensors in the home, mm. and we had informed consent for the, the electrical users, and they agreed to participate in the study. And the idea was could they stagger their on switch to the air conditioning so they would avoid peak load. And mm-hmm. that was really interesting. It worked really good until day three, and they've had it. I'm putting the air conditioning on. <laughs> yeah. kind of yeah. Those moments, yeah. and because uh, this is an Appalachian uh, power, which is in more in the south, humidity. This oh, was so like August, hot. right? Yeah, yeah. so it's your t- human sticky. tolerances are. Right. I'm ready at day three to just say, okay, enough with the study. I'm switching gears. Yeah. But we learned a lot from that, right? And so, and this is one of those projects where I really liked the research, mm-hmm. and I it was getting data that was going to be important for decision making and those kind of things. And then I'll say, or so I thought, <laughs> until the report was generated, and then it went into a file cabinet. And uh, I was like, what just happened there? We're doing all this research. We're getting insight, and then we're just going to file it. Okay, check the box. That's done. Aren't we going to use this stuff? Mm-hmm. And so it was one of was those. was a power company just under some sort of mandate that they just had yeah, to do the report that right they didn't around need Carter, to. when Carter had the, this, the, these mm-hmm. things for alternative energy, and I think they met the requirement. And that was it. And then there – you know, but, uh, you know, I'm only seeing one, like, you know, one-tenth right, baby right, of the right. picture and not the overall economic need of the company. Mm-hmm. So I can't judge here. You know, it's just this is what I saw personally. And it was like, I like the research, but I really want people to use it. Yeah. Right. So so then it was, let's go to grad school. Got and, it. And 
Um, I didn't want to fossilize in the job, which I kind of saw happening around me. And I, again, was off looking for schools. And I found UNC Chapel Hill, mm -hmm. which was great. So it was Carolina. Now, that's right. My Michael Jordan was there as well. There's a story behind that. <laughs> um, but uh, the reason why I like that is I could coach gymnastics and pay for my graduate education that way. And then also there was um, a person in basically a human biology setup as well as in physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So that worked out good. So I'd have two different people to work with, and off I'd go. Okay, so I quit my job, moved to Carolina, which is a cultural adjustment. Mm -hmm. And um, and then what happened is I got there, and day one my advisor said, I just want you to know I've decided to start my own business. Today's my last day. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And then I'm going, oh, boy. <laughs> so, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because then all of my classes were over physical therapy. So I have as much of what's the same courses a physical therapist would have because the med school's right there on campus with mm -hmm. the um, the undergrad. And so that worked out great, you know. And so, of course, you go along for a couple years and I'm coaching sports and at the same time I'm doing my graduate work. And... Um, the advisor was from Penn State, and that's one of the top PhD programs in biomechanics in the country. And he goes, you, you really you really need to think about going there. And so I applied, and that's what my next step was. Right? Huh. So I re retired from coaching gymnastics, mm -hmm. um, but then I was off to Penn State. And then we did everything wrong. We Let's see. <laughs> we got married. We bought a house. We moved. We changed jobs. All in two weeks, which is like, oh, my God. You're like, <laughs> this is like all wow. the <laughs> – this is my husband and I, right? So interesting. He was actually working in alternative energy in the research triangle in Carolina. Oh, yeah. But he, at this point, then had five years of experience and a professional engineering degree. So we moved to central Pennsylvania where Penn State is, and uh -huh. he's teaching electrical engineering at the branch campus at Altoona. And then I'm doing my PhD. So wait, did you buy the house in North Carolina, or did you buy the house in Penn, Pennsylvania? Penn State, Penn State. Okay, so, <laughs> so you basically uprooted and dug as many deep roots as you possibly could at Penn All State at once during, <laughs> during a PhD program. Yeah, while starting a PhD program. Yeah, and just for the record, my husband and I are still married. <laughs> it worked out. It worked out. He's actually a professor at UCLA, so we kind of been doing this tag it's, team it's, thing it's for working, a while. It's been working for a while. Yes. That's good. So, so it all worked out. So he's teaching, and he ended up playing rugby actually for the oh. Penn State team. So that was good to keep him occupied while I was, you know, doing my research <laughs> yeah. stuff. And then I, I was actually working with the gymnastics team, um, but more as a consultant, but not as a coach. So I could help the coaches make better decisions and practice planning and things like that, and athlete preparation, but still getting my PhD. So mm -hmm. it's very fortunate to have um, really good mentors there, especially a woman, Jean Landa Pytel, who was in engineering mechanics. And um, she had been through the PhD program herself. Um, and she was a great mentor to the number of, we had kind of three women at that point um, mm -hmm. coming through, which is kind of unusual. Right. Um, but she really helped us kind of figure all that stuff out. One of my colleagues came in with one child and pregnant and starting a PhD program. So we were learning a lot about how yeah. to balance wow. all of mm -hmm. this at the same time. So right. and her husband was also in a PhD program. So, you know, it's these things can be done. It's just it's really nice to have some support. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Figuring out how, how, how do you do this? Yeah. Right. And then have each other, obviously. Right. So then I graduated from Penn State, defended my dissertation, got in the car, drove two weeks, and started teaching here. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then my husband started his I PhD to, program so, at UCLA. It's, it's amazing that since then there haven't been, like, drastic moves. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, it seems like that's the norm for about eight years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're just like, let's boom, let's move it, let's yeah, move yeah, it, let's yeah. move it. Well, it gets a little more complicated, you know, Ooh, and then yeah. my husband has to get his PhD, and then he ended up staying at UCLA, and he's in um, biomedical physics there in the mm -hmm. Department of Radiology, so he's a PhD and in a medical um, school. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at that point, let's see, my daughter was born um, while I was not tenured. It was like in my first six years here. Mm -hmm. And then, um, in full disclosure, I was pregnant with my second child when I was going up for tenure, but I was making sure no one knew about that. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> because at the time, I think I was one of 13 women in all of the sciences and engineering. Wow. And now, look where we've come, right? You know, with the, the wise change. contribution and having that endowment, we've been able to really enrich the whole process for our undergrads mm -hmm. and our and our faculty and things like that. So, Absolutely. So it was one of those things where once you have your lab set up, it was like, 
I don't think I can handle another move on this. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just, you know. We'll stay here. Stay here. And it worked out for my husband, too. So it was like, now we have that two-body challenge, or two, I call it a two-body opportunity. Yeah, yes. of course, yes. To then, um, and that's worked out really well for us. That's good. So I don't know if that's all of what you wanted to hear, but it. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> the entire life story. Are you, <laughs> that's right. Are, are that's you, how I got here in 1988. <laughs> That was really cool. Uh, and probably the most succinct uh, yeah. of anyway. Um, so are you from Ohio originally? I, I was born in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. I did uh, lived in Ohio for a little bit. Okay. And then grew up in upstate New York, right okay. between Schenectady and Saratoga. That's what you said. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. So One you've red been, light town kind of thing. I was going to say, so we've got upstate <laughs> New York. LA. <laughs> that's that's kind of where I'm going with my question. Upstate New York, Miami, Ohio, uh North Carolina, Chapel, Chapel Hill. Hill. You got P- Penn State. Yeah, State College. Yeah. And then you got L.A. Yeah. I mean, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> no, not at all. And so, wh- wh- how yeah. has that been for you uh, growing up, and and more specifically, even through the eyes of, of your kids who have oh, only absolutely. known L.A. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it because you know it's very homogeneous in upstate New York where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had foreign exchange students, but that was about it, right? right? And then. Even going to Ohio, the pace slows down. In Carolina, it even slows down even further. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus, you end up with very political, different ideology and history yeah. uh, above and below the Mason-Dixon line and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you get exposed to that. But that's the part about grad school that's kind of cool. It's like you can go live for a while and be immersed in that culture, but you don't have to stay. Yeah. And you also learn of, you know... Like a tourist gonna, visa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah kind of. but an extended one, right? Yeah, so yeah. you really get an idea to see who's going to thrive in this environment or not, right? So um, so that's the cool part. And then coming out here, my husband is from Riverside, so oh. we had some California connections there. But the cool part for my kids is that they went to public school just south of UCLA, mm-hmm. and we had to find um, a place where we had after-school care because both my husband and I had long hours. And um, But that was cool. There's 27 different languages spoken at home. My kids got an international experience here in L.A. It's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, they don't see stuff. They they don't see race. You know, I mean, right. it's there. But it's like, yeah, whatever. You know, right. <laughs> it's like it just is. And, yeah. and I don't think you would get that, say, if we were in upstate New York. It's, yeah. it's just so homogeneous. You just don't get exposed. Right. It's, you know, not your fault. It's just you don't know. And right. so um, that was great. Yeah. And so they've really embraced that. And the kids have. It's very cool to see what they've picked up along along the way on that. So, That's cool. Yeah. Now, um, so what, what I'm hearing is this is a is a is a girl interested in math and sports. Yep. And so, how does that translate to what you're doing now? And and more specifically, <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, oh, I'm teeing up the softball questions I know, really. here. I'm, it's not like I don't know the answer to these questions, but maybe our audience doesn't. Uh, yeah. Um, but so and this is this, I guess, the answer of biomechanics. And so, yeah. uh, help us understand what that is. Yeah. So, so I think sometimes when you're an athlete, you're always going, "Why is the coach having us do this? <laughs> I don't get the connection, right?" And so. Uh, but I really liked how am I the why part, right? And so, and this is the research path is that we don't always know the answer. You have to actually discover it and you have to ask good questions and do good experiments if you're going to actually advance knowledge. And so I really like that process. And statistics and math is a g- really good way of doing it because you had tools to establish causal relationships. But then you have bring in the physics, and now you've got really more mechanistic things. So it's it's a natural thing. I think also being a gymnast um, you're kind of a practicing physicist to start with yeah. because if you're going to flip and twist and not kill yourself in the process, mm-hmm. you kind of have to know your mechanics. Yeah. And But I didn't know it was mechanics. No, I just, was doing you know, mechanics. That's going to know. hurt. That's going to break. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where I could use some leverage. <laughs> right, and, and exactly. But the most important thing was learning how to fall mm-hmm. because if you made a mistake, you could bail out and survive, right? And I think that's a really important thing about sports because – any practice, any season, you get a do-over next year, right? right. Yeah. And you get a do-over. If you miss the ball in field hockey, you just bust your butt and go back and help your team get the ball back. I mean, so you goof up, but you can fix it. And you have this iteration, right? And this is much like engineering design, right? Mm-hmm. 
you try, you fail, you think, you learn, you redo, you try, you fail, <laughs> you right. think, you redo. You know, that's the process, right? And I think sports... Different failures at different points and different things you didn't account for that one time. And yes, and the, and the knowledge of having good coaches to guide you along yeah. the way and mentorship is really important. Having a constructive environment and teamwork. So most of the stuff that are accomplished is never done by an individual. It's always a team. Um, and having good teamwork with different viewpoints and skill sets. Not everybody can be the quarterback who's going to receive right. the ball, mm -hmm. these kind of things. And so sport builds that into you, whether you know it or not. And so I do a lot of STEAM in sports where you're using science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Mm -hmm. Um, and you sport as a vehicle to get kids excited about that because all those same skills that you need to be successful in sport are the same things you need to be a good researcher, scientist, engineer, mathematician. So. Which is member of society, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> and you're durable. You, you fall down, you get back up, right? Yeah. It's, it's how you get back up. And, you know, some losses are really painful. It's like, man, was that stupid, you know, or – you know, if yeah. only and these kind of things. But you learn and you yeah. get a redo. And I think those are things that um, I was a, lucky to have coaches that allowed you to make mistakes and and took it as an opportunity to learn and then allow you to try again. And that kind of support, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. And so it's no surprise that most, of, most if not everyone in the lab, <clears throat> has played sports and likes yeah. sports. Yeah. Um, and so – we have really good teamwork in there. They yeah. already get it. I don't have to teach them that they come with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're not, you know, I've created an environment where it's really hard to break anything in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's it's true. like durable enough that, yeah. you know, students are going to get a hold of it. They might make a mistake, but it's not going to be, you know, too bad. And yeah. you'll make your way through it together. So. So, Rhea, you've been in the lab for all four years? Or? Yeah, for all four years. So I started October of my freshman year. What got you interested? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting old too. <laughs> what, what got you interested in the biomechanics lab? And and then, from your perspective, what is biomechanics, and what are you doing in there? Mm, so I got interested in it because it's a very similar story, and I think it's the same background story for almost everyone who joins the lab. I loved sports growing up. Um, I did gymnastics for ten years as a kid, and then I um, quit right before high school. And then I started swimming, dancing, and then doing track and field um, all through high school. And in my freshman year, like fast forward to college, I was taking BME 101, which is the intro um, biomedical engineering class. And the first day of class, we were told to like research labs on campus just to learn what BME was. Um, and my group was assigned biomechanics. And then I found Jill's lab. Um, and I was like, wow, this is everything that I like because it's engineering and it's sports. And it's using math and science to explain how to be a better athlete. And that was something that really resonated with me because the same way that Jill was talking about it, sports is something that became really integral to like my entire childhood and my high school career. I coached gymnastics through high school too. Um, all of my best friends in high school were athletes, and then I joined Ultimate Frisbee in college too. So I loved being in that environment and then using what I was learning in the classroom and applying it to making athletes perform better sounded like the perfect thing to get involved with. So how do you make athletes perform better? Like what, what is, mm -hmm. what is the, What's the magic sauce there? You want to answer that way? Yeah, I, I can start, and then Jill can <laughs> give a better answer. <laughs> it does um, sound like a test. It's like, <laughs> no, I know. She's been through a lot, you've been through a lot of different scenarios, yeah, we've, actually. We've yeah, we've done a lot of different projects while I've been there because um, I came at a time where – there was a few grad students that graduated my sophomore year, and then a new crop came in my junior year. So we've been doing a bunch of different projects in the lab throughout. But what we basically do is use engineering principles to study how the body moves and then how to optimize that movement. So like my freshman year, we were looking at golf players and tennis players, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, yeah, and we were putting little motion capture sensors on joints in their body mm -hmm. and tracing how those joints were moving over time during mm -hmm. like specific movements that they're doing. So for a golf player, we were looking at their swing. Um, and then we were studying how that changed. We would take like 50 trials or something and we would see which ones correlated with um, better um, what's the word, distance, like better swing distance yeah. um, for the golf ball. And then we would see, okay, what makes this swing better than this swing? And we would use things like vector overlay and, and like physics principles, mechanics, to explain what was the quantitative difference between those swings. Mm -hmm. And then we, the next step would be looking at how to incorporate 
that into training and how to explain that to athletes. Yeah. So it's like pretty much using physics and science to explain what makes motions better and then using that to create training plans for coaches. Hmm. So it's like a two-step process. There's the research and the science behind actual like movements and then there's also the translating to coaches and athletes and making that into practice. And there is a, uh, a strong connection to mm -hmm. our athletics department, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And working with different teams here on campus? Yeah, so this is all very much coach-driven. And mm. sometimes coaches have questions about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to distinguish. We're not coaches here. Got it. We're just supporting the team if they have questions or trying to clarify to the athlete what it is they're actually trying to do. So there's sometimes we can bring technology and then put it in a place where that technology through our basic science, we know that might be helpful. So if we can train the coaches to use the technology, they then can use that information to improve their athletes. So they will take that information and then use it to help coach. So a lot of times we do a lot of coaching education in between where I'm meeting with coaches in the off season, mm -hmm. finding out where their challenges are. And there are many. And with student athletes, they don't have a whole lot of time to improve technique. And then so if we better understand where the trouble spots are, we then go back to the lab, figure out what it is we could do to give a little more insight mm -hmm. that the coaches can use themselves when they actually coach the athlete. And that's the cool part because mm – -hmm. When the coaches understand what the athlete's really trying to do, then it's a lot clearer to both the head coach and the whole coaching staff, as well as the support team with the trainers and things and strength and conditioning. Then they understand what they're really trying to build. <clears throat> and then what happens is then the coach is actually able to use some of the technology being able to put in the gym to actually leverage that to help the learning process mm -hmm. because it's very much cause-effect. So. They may see all sorts of motion, but really the bottom line is you want to go fast in that direction. You need a force in that direction over right. time. Mm -hmm. so it becomes very clear. And so then they also get better at how they cue the athlete, what they focus on, how they prepare practice plans, mm -hmm. how they do checkpoints to see if improvements are actually happening. So it's really putting that in the hands of the coaches for them to do their thing. And we don't pretend to know their, their athletes. It's always better coming from the coach to the athlete anyways mm -hmm. because that's the relationship. That's key. We're just support team in the back, yeah. you know, helping stuff out. And so it, a lot of it's very different. You know, sometimes it's a, an experience. Sometimes it's years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes it's um, collect the data and let us know in five years what you're learning. You know, it's all different kinds of relationships, and it, it's really coach-driven. So we, we do this also with uh, USA national teams. Mm -hmm. So we work at uh, Olympic Training Center down in Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gone to the National Training Center for USA diving, gymnastics, all these other <laughs> sports um, over the years. And so we've, we've kind of tuned our way of approaching this. Mm -hmm. So it's very much um, driven by the coaches or the national governing body of sport to be what they need it to be, and then we tune or curate what we do so it matches what, what they're trying to accomplish. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we do the same thing in rehab. So we work with Rancho Los Amigos National yeah. Rehab Center. Right. And that's very cool because you're still trying to improve performance. Physical rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the cool part is the engineering bit that goes with it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to – I should make sure people don't mistake rehab for like a oh, yeah. oh. Know, like tabloid term. Of rehab. <laughs> oh, no, not that rehab. No, sorry. <laughs> we don't have expertise no, no, no. in that. It's more like mobility. The, yeah, mobility. Yeah, right. I know yeah. we're all on the same page. Wheelchairs, right? <laughs> you know, orthosis, mm -hmm. you know, yes. uh, prosthetics, yeah. these right, kind of things. Right, right. And we've done some really cool work with the um, Paralympic athletes. And yeah. Oh, cool. That's really cool because it's like we're human meets engineering and now you have a new challenge right you yeah know? and it's it's very interesting because the cool thing about the human body is that it can adapt to different things you know you're gonna land mm -hmm. differently if it's a sprung mm -hmm. surface or a mat or a hard surface mm -hmm. but when you have a prosthetic it's kind of like designed for one scenario like mm -hmm. keeping your speed in the middle of a 400 race yeah. yeah but you still have to take that same device and accelerate out the blocks so now you have a device that's designed for something very different than what you Right. need to do yeah. an acceleration phase. Mm -hmm. So you start with what the athlete or person can do and then figure out what they need to do, like uh, huh. Rio was saying, in terms of mechanical objectives. And then you put that together and figure out how do we use this technology to help them learn yeah. to be effective. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do you, <laughs> I, I have many questions. Uh, so <laughs> are there any, like, really cool that you're able to share those coaching stories or athlete stories that that you can say, yeah, we we had our mark on that athlete, and then they went on and did something afterwards. Or... Probably the USATF people. Oh yeah. yeah. Wait, so we did horizontal jumps, and I'll yeah. just simply say, look at the results in Rio. In Rio, yeah, yeah. horizontal jumps. 
In Rio. Mm-hmm. In Rio for the track and field team. Because yeah. you just use an acronym. USA Track and Field? USA, USA Track and Field. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, no That's one just a... answered my question. You all just, <laughs> you all just yeah, talked just, around it's it. It's part of why we don't answer and we don't name names. Off, is of because, course. Yeah. Because we do human subject research. So we yeah. keep everything... Um, that was one of my, like, yeah, could yeah. you actually talk about it? Yeah. But yeah. you worked with but USA, USA Track and Field But you get the results team. and you'll figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> right, and yeah. then the jumps, if you look from Beijing to Rio. Was it Beijing? London. London. London, London, London to Rio. Rio. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's very, fu- it's it's cool. I mean, we are only a very small bit of their success. And the of course, coolest of part, course, you can't make take no. claim and say, like, oh, I got to. And I want to be extremely clear sure, about yeah. this. This is their deal. We're just there in the back helping support them. But it has been really wonderful working with the coaches that they have because um, the many of the coaches will embrace the technology and um, we can then help them make better decisions and track their athletes and deal with challenges and things like that. So we're, again, you know, way back in the back room mm-hmm. in the support team. They're doing all the hard work on the day-to-day, day-to-day and we're just there to help them, right. you know. Right. figured out yeah and i think on a smaller scale like that one is usatf so that's a national organization but then um marissa is also work marissa is one of the grad students in our mm-hmm. lab she's also working on this project with the pac-12 which is really cool um because four universities are coming together to do research on cross-country athletes mm. so it's stanford oregon boulder and usc yep. that's yep. coming together um and all of those different universities are collecting data on their cross-country runners and it'll be a, a several year study to see how um Basically, to trace like running patterns and correlation with stress fractures huh. that develop in cross country runners from overuse, because that's really common. Wow. In, um, it's a program runners. they just started with health and wellness of student athletes, and the mm-hmm. Pac 12 is running it. It's very cool because this is the way to study this. Is yeah. There's a layer there where even though we're all competing with each other, mm-hmm. we also want to bring out the best in our athletes. Yeah. So, is there a way mm-hmm. that we can share and learn from each other to keep athletes healthy, get them at the starting line, and then the competition can start? So we found a really nice place for to have that happen. And yeah. it's a really nice blend of they're using wearable technology, GPS, mm. heart rates, we're bringing the physiology in to go with the biomechanics. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then, you know, to see what we can actually learn. Is any of the things we're collecting worthwhile knowing? Is there any relationship? You can't assume. You actually have yeah. to determine. So. Mm-hmm. That's where we are right now. Get together so, yeah. a bunch of data and be like, okay, that didn't tell us anything. Or that told us something we already knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, just and, looking for patterns. And there's a lot of technology that comes out, and you have to actually validate it's actually measuring what you really value, right? Sure. It will give you some numbers, but you have to do your due diligence and make sure it's the <laughs> things you really need to know yeah. Yeah. to then you know base your decisions on. And that's the mm-hmm. part because we're a research lab. We have to do that of stuff course. all in the back yeah. room. Of yeah. course. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a number of different students in your lab mm-hmm. and it's a number of uh it's an interdisciplinary lab. Yes. And so what makes up the, the what's the makeup of your of your lab and your Well it's really interesting at the moment because mm-hmm. we have um PhD students in aerospace, biomedical engineering, and integrative and evolutionary biology. And they all sit together, but also in orthopedics, biomechanics yeah. as well, and, and ankle replacements. Um, so that's kind of the PhD group, and that's cool because they're doing experimental work, but also dynamic modeling work, and it kind of is a zigzag. So mm. experimental results will um, lay the foundation for some of the control logic algorithms we use in the musculoskeletal dynamics modeling that we do simulations got for. It. So we've got the zigzag. But then we have students who are doing some progressive masters, and then we also have undergrad students. And the undergrad students can be from a lot of interactive media, human biology, biomedical engineering, um, mechanical engineering, computer science, and art. We actually had some art people doing the human body drawings, which Neat. is very cool. Yeah. yeah. And then um, we also have high school students who come into lab. We're actually working with um, the math science college prep school out in West Adams. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have four kids who have um, taken AP computer science and how to program in Java and Python. They've um, taken engineering design mm-hmm. things and that kind of thing, and they're coming to the lab. And one of my former students is actually their teacher in STEM. Oh, and so really? that's, you know, Andrea. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so um, it's made it possible for these kids, because they're seniors, right? And they're going to go to college. Yeah. They don't know where yet. They're still excited about that. Um, but we're teaching them how to find a lab, and they can continue this pathway wherever they end up going. And they get a little bit of lab experience, and that's going to help the next step because, you know, they go to a lab director and say, yeah, I've, I've worked in a lab, I've done these things. Right. They're going to say, oh, yeah, you're serious about this. You know, let's try this out and see how it goes. So it gives them the next pathway. Yeah, yeah. that's so, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we have – 
quite arranged at the moment <laughs> <laughs> to making that happen. Yeah. But I do this with uh, also with Henrik Flaschner yeah. in, um, in aerospace, aerospace and mechanical engineering, yeah. mm -hmm. and also Lorraine Turcott, who's more on the metabolism side. So this oh. we bring the exercise physiology bit together. That's fantastic. And then we have uh, Ryan Wilcox over in psychology who helps us make the most of the data we do collect in terms of getting inferences, especially in small sample sizes. Uh -huh. Because sometimes we may have nine subjects, and that's 100% of the national team. And so that's all <laughs> that's you get, you right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. So we got the whole population, but sometimes the statistical approaches need a little uh, creative yeah. uh, logic. Do, you, do yeah. you foresee new types of collaborations across competitive teams, like like the Pac-12 coming together? Mm -hmm. Do you see, I don't know if this is possible, but nations coming together and in terms of international like yeah cuz so you just said like you know we had nine people that's a total of the national team but yeah, what yeah. if we were able to pull that out and grab yeah. you know uh, yeah. this country's runners that country's runners mm -hmm. to to using the Pac-12 model as its base so um, I've been involved with the IOC medical commission hmm. for this IOC meaning international olympic, yeah, olympic committee, committee yeah. Yeah. and so uh, that's been very interesting I've been very fortunate to be able to actually collect data during the 96 olympics and also again in 2000 hmm. And I think to some degree we're able to do some of that stuff. I think uh, in Japan and Tokyo 2020 there will be more of that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dance between the Olympic Committee and the national and international governing about its sport and then the local people that are handling the venues and things like that. But we've been able to collect data in the real environment because no matter what I do, I can't recreate the Olympics in my lab. Yeah. And we did some really cool projects and landings of gymnasts to, in Sydney. And, and so you're on spot. You're on. You're on the scene there. Oh yeah. With your motion capture or your with some sort of cameras to yeah. gather all that yeah. information. So cameras it's very interesting it. because um, you need to get a camera spot. And there's already like 35 to 60 cameras with NBC and all the yeah. mm -hmm. international broadcasting mm -hmm. groups. So we get to know them quite well because our spots and their spots tend to be overlapping. We have to make friends. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but we have to go through a complete background check. And, I mean, this is a year and a half out, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to get credentials and show up early. But like then, press. Like, like you, same you, thing like as press, press yeah. credentials. Yeah. And then um, because we need to calibrate the space that the athlete's moving in, we have to get permission to get down on the floor. And then we have calibration devices that have to fit in overhead luggage. Um, to then create a oh space gosh. where you can get the coordinates, you can predict where the 3D coordinates will be when the person flies through the space and lands. Yeah. And so by using um, those cameras, those fixed cameras and camera constants, we're able to actually um, get the calibration box out before all the people come in to watch the event. Um, but the cameras don't move, so we're able to calibrate that space and then get 3D coordinates wow. and then study what is happening actually in competition. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool, isn't it? So, how, so you've been so you've been to how many Olympics? Um, so I've been to ninety six in Atlanta, two thousand in Sydney. Um, then we had I think Greece in two thousand four. I didn't Athens. do that one. Um, there was a number of security issues with that one. Yeah, and then um, but Beijing. then I think we were Beijing, yeah. right? Then London, then Rio, right, yeah. and Tokyo. So I've been to all but Athens. And so we've done different things. I got so lucky in the London Olympics. I happened to be right across from the men's springboard event, and I was able to get all the first the preliminary rounds by luck. And this has all been gymnastics? Well, this was diving. This is oh, springboard diving. diving. Springboard, excuse yeah. me. The, uh, the gymnastics was in um, Atlanta hmm. and also in Sydney. We tried to do it in London, but something happened at the very end. We if Somebody didn't hmm. like something, and mm -hmm. that becomes very easy to pull the plug on some of these things. Yeah. But I do think the local organizing group try to do things, and then they try to, you know, all this stuff gets published and in the research eventually. So mm -hmm. I think internationally we share. That's so, great. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> from a from a layman's perspective, someone could be listening to this and saying, okay, well, this 3D mapping, they're, they're doing that on NBC. And I'm assuming it's not the same thing, right? There's not a level of accuracy. When they, they show, like, oh, this is the point at which they turned. This is the point at which they landed. They That's the pressure. They draw those little arrows. And, those little yeah, arrows yeah. and like, even in baseball now, they're showing, mm -hmm. like, strikes and balls and yeah. all these different elements. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is very different. Um, I put it on a spectrum, right? Okay. So mm -hmm. some things you need a level of accuracy. Like, the difference between, like, the jumps that we see, if we didn't have force plates in the – Takeoff area, you wouldn't be able to differentiate this well enough from Kinemax alone. You would need to measure forces and things like that. Yeah. Um, but then by having the forces in the kinematics, you also have predictive models and things. When you don't have all the information you need, you may be able to predict. Got it. Um, this takes a lot of 
uh, good engineering work in yeah. the back to, to do that. Now, to give you an idea of where you are in space and get an accurate projection of strikes and balls, they've been working on that. It's a pretty fundamental thing in baseball, right? right. So there's technology that's built specifically to get that. Yeah, it's done. into that plate. and into yeah. That, yeah. But I don't know if you could tell the internal and external rotation of the forearm of the pitcher at the time of release, right? So some things mm. it can do well, other things – Best not to comment because it may not act, be accurate <laughs> enough, right? Because the other part is making sure the information that's out there <clears throat> is accurate. You don't want to mislead people right. because people are listening to the broadcast and they are listening to what the announcers say. And if the announcers aren't educated on you know, key fundamentals that athletes in that sport should be paying attention to and they say something, a whole bunch of kids may go out and play it tomorrow and start right. using what you just said. So right. it would be great to have a little more um, – uh, broadcast yeah. education yeah. going on be cool. because they, they are a voice and yeah. they have an impact and mm-hmm. people are listening. Yeah. And so if you can actually get them up to speed on the key elements, that's a, that'd mm-hmm. be great. We should have some, you know, journalistic folks mm-hmm. actually did some, some teaching guest teaching in our journalism school here, huh. trying to bring people in to say, yeah, you know, you've got a platform here. How do we help right. get the sports science out there? Well, I feel like this is an episode of Real Sports. I mean, I think we got to get Brian Gumbel's team down here to talk to you right away. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. it, because I think if we even just spend a little bit of time, if you're a broadcaster, oftentimes you stay in a sport. Yeah. It'd be great for them to spend a little bit of time with us and get them up to speed on stuff. Yeah. They'd be, that'd be really helpful. I think. Because there are two essential elements to the work that you're doing, which is optimizing performance and reducing injury. Yep. Yeah. Is that the, the two basic yeah. things? We try to have not have the injury happen at all. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. Right. yeah, reducing elimination. Yes, Eliminate, yes. elimination. Reducing the risk. Yes, reducing that's the, the risk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and and then the, the other question I have from a, a layman perspective is that there are, you know, we mentioned golf swings, mm-hmm. we mentioned um, running. Um, there's a lot of consumer technology out today, yes. whether it's the watch or your phone or the special golf glove, and it'll tell you your swing and how. It, basically, selling what you just described mm-hmm. for, and I know it's not, but it's not my, the same thing. Not at all. At all. So yes, how, yeah. how do we, how do we help our audience distinguish between these apps and this, this mm-hmm. wearable technology that's out there to mm-hmm. the work that you're doing? So, so we're playing around with this in our undergrad labs. It's yeah. kind of a little bit more on the citizen science thing. Okay. So, you know, experiment, yeah. see what, see what that data is. So here's an example. Dr. Turcott and I um, live kind of in the same area of town and we walk to the train together and we take the train. So we're walking together. We're on the same path. Um, I walked 2.2 miles and she only walked 1.7 miles. Now, how can that be? Mm-hmm. Right? Based on your wearables. Based on yeah. our wearables Got or it. our phones or whatever, whatever the app. Yeah. So then the question is, is how can that be? Right? And then she's like, how can that be? So she d- re- traces her step on the way home. She gets a different number. Mm-hmm. So part of this is the reliability. Can you trust the information? Right? Because there's algorithms in there. And they're probably making an assumption that our legs are certain lengths yeah. or something. Yeah. Right. And so um, – you know, but then it's know how that technology. So another fun one is is that um, some might be using arm swing to count steps. Well, think about in a grocery store. I'm going to take my arms, I'm going to put it on the grocery cart, and my arms aren't going to move. So I'm not going to get any steps, right? Because <laughs> my arms are yeah. Fine. Right. So this is my wife. To... This is my wife and I's ongoing debate and competition. When our daughter was younger, and mm-hmm. we were at Disneyland. Mm-hmm. And we would, we would, she would get incredibly upset, or I would get incredibly upset because whoever was pushing the stroller uh-huh. got way less steps. Oh, <laughs> <Well, that>. yeah. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. so then, then as we started recognizing it, we would start walking holding the old stroller only with our right arm. Oh, so you <laughs> so we, we got to get this going. And she got super competitive about it at some point. She's like, I have to do this. <laughs> and I would do this. You know, it ends up being like the we things, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, nephew yeah, would do that. Yeah, He's yeah. on the couch, laying down, moving his arm like this. Yeah, you That's, points. Well, that's the same <laughs> technology. That's the accelerometer. Yeah. I noticed that when yeah. I first got my watch yeah. back when, in 2015, um, I <laughs> the first thing I did was a Meet USC, which is one of our presentations, yeah. and I sit during those. Yeah. And I recognize that I, like, hit my exercise max. Yeah. In my 45-minute talk, because I'm talking like this. Oh, yeah. lot, I, I'm like, oh, I, I definitely talk with my hands on. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. But, yeah, it's yes. the same idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this is the part about responsible use of the content. And then are you really measuring what you value? Or all of a sudden you're right. putting value on what you measured. Uh, that's a right? good point. And, that's, and that's point. I love that statement. It's not mine. Someone else came up with that. But I like that because that's what ends up happening is that you have these sensors. It does measure this. And so it's like look, I have this hammer, I'm looking for that nail, right, mm-hmm. you know, that I can use it for. And that's not a 
bad idea, you know, when you've got a sure. product and you are trying to figure out an application for that technology, but just realize what it does and does well and what it doesn't do well. Mm-hmm. And then that way you're a responsible user of the content that you're getting and making sure you're getting the things that actually are of value. So yeah. if I'm looking at enger- engineering me- or um, injury mechanics, it might not it'd be enough to know how many steps, but it's how you step or how you control that step. Yeah. And that's a little harder to get that information. And that's what we do at the research level, right? It's really trying to figure out the how and the why, not just the number of. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so do you foresee your research or the work you're doing eventually getting to the point yes. of, of creating those consumer um, uh, wearables or technology? I think so, because I, I think a lot of times when we find – that there are companies that have good technology and they're willing to listen to the end user and really work with us, um, that we're able to help them be better at the things we, we, we want them to succeed, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're in the business of mm-hmm. making. We'd like them to put good product out there so people get good content, and then that helps drive decisions. Um, so th- I think finding a way to partner with them in a meaningful way where there's good communication, and they don't always want to hear that, well, if you put the sensor on that way, it's going to move a lot because it's on the muscle. And so now the orientation system is moving in 3D, and mm-hmm. it's just because the muscle's flexing. They may not really want to hear that. Um, but at the same time, if they listen, they realize, oh, if I split the two sensors, I can have this one monitor EMG, mm-hmm. this one monitor segment acceleration, and they can get there with not yeah. too much tech mm-hmm. adjustment. But you have to have a lot of listening between the end user mm-hmm. and the company. I think it's good business practice to know your customers and what they're trying to really measure. Um, and so that's a, a really key piece going forward. Uh, we do a lot of things with the military and also lead athletes at a level that we probably can't really talk about. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the issue is, you know, how do you do it and make it in a consumer um, type of mode where that can actually happen. Got so it. definitely – definitely coming and we're, we're also building the back end of this so realize also when you're collecting a fire hose worth of data like just think about all the data points you got coming to work today already right, right. who's going to manage that data right. so we work a lot with some of the uh, wise women in computer science who deal with privacy issues hardware mm-hmm. allows the analytics to happen right. you know messy data cleaning it up um, mm-hmm. privacy security backup all of that so there's a whole back end of the database structure so right. to for the AI that's coming. And so um, we definitely work in, we have teams in that area too that's part of our data-driven human performance consortium here. Huh. So I have so many questions about the military now, but I'll leave it alone. Um, so given current wearables on the market today, yep. um, obviously we have watches, we have wristbands, we've got, um, we've got shoes now that, yeah. are, that need... Charging. Charging. Have you seen all the recent news the last (laughs) week about, you know, their shoes got bricked? Yeah. (laughs) Um, What do you think is, what is something you would recommend to an athlete? Is there anything out there? I don't even know how to answer that question. It depends on what your question is. Well, it depends what your question is. If if you're just, you're having trouble getting motivated to get out and move, counting steps is not a bad way of doing that because that's your goal, right? Right. For my elite athletes, I don't think they really they're care not, about that doing very well, right? Yeah. So it just depends on when they need what to improve whatever it is that they're trying Got to it. do. So this is the curating of it, right? So mm-hmm. it's like having a good experiment. We just don't do experiments for experiment's sake. You try to really understand the problem, figure out what the key questions are, and also recognize that I may not be able to answer that question in 2019, but 2014, yeah. I imagine the sensor will be good enough to do that. Oftentimes we end up saturating the accelerometers on the running, Mm -hmm. for example. They're not – the accelerometer needs to be replaced. Companies didn't see that coming. We have to wait a couple years before that develops. But we have the whole back end to do everything else, and then when that new technology comes out, Mm -hmm. then we're ready to go. So I imagine the technology is going to change a lot, but the way you analyze is not because it's still physics. Mm-hmm. And it's still biology. Right. And that's the important thing for students to recognize. All this math and science and engineering, these are principles that you can actually use to understand cause effect, right? Mm-hmm. So get to know those skills, <laughs> right? And also the data management, computer sciences, and da- data visualization techniques, because mm-hmm. that puts it in context. And realize the tech's going to be subbed out. Yeah. And that's going to be fast moving. So, so back to your original question is you can get – depends on the question – and then, then you find the sure. measurement device will best give you that resolution and reliability that you need. Got it. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. So, do you use any of the wearable technology stuff for your undergraduate class at all? Yeah, so this is the fun part. So yeah. one of my students actually started a wearable um, company, mm-hmm. and it came from being in my biomechanics class, and then I have a, a bioenergetics class, and he's like, I'm a, I'm a track athlete. I wish I, I had this growing up. I would, this would really help my coaches. And he's created a, um, a system, this whole body stuff. And so okay. we just piloted think, this on yeah. Thursday. Yeah. And, um, the, Can we say know, what company it is or no? Um, yeah, I think it's Equilibrium. Yeah. Equilibrium? The, yeah, it's Vayu is the... Vayu, yeah. Bayou they came and spoke co- at an ASBME meeting last week. Too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah this is like Quran. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and um, so, you know, the other the thing I really like about their system it, um, is that they uh, are able to take the data in a way that the undergrad students could analyze the data. Mm-hmm. And they can ask the questions, you know... This is what the sensor says, but if I look at the video, is that sensor results actually going to match up? So this allows them to also be aware of the sensors measured this, but is it of the sufficient resolution to answer questions about that? Mm -hmm. And by involving the undergrad students in that process of collecting their own data and then checking that data against another source that's kind of the gold standard, do they add up? How might you use this to answer different questions? And that then allows student-driven projects because they Mm -hmm. may – you know, want to study um, office ergonomics or, right. you know, people who load trucks for a living and you're in workman's compensation or maybe they want to be a dentist and they want to preserve the upper extremity biomechanics so they can pay off the school loans, right? <laughs> you know, and work long enough without getting an overuse injury, which mm-hmm. is actually a big yeah, deal. Yeah, fine motor control. I mean, yep. th- all this is yep. much more valuable. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, so they get to pick the project that they want, but then they're using the technology and they get to ask themselves, is it sufficient for the questions I have? And that's what we're trying to bring into our undergrad classes. So we have a major in human biology, but we also have a minor in human movement science. And this is a, a it has no prereqs by design. Because there may be students in interactive media, over in engineering, computer science that are interested Very in cool. developing this. But if you want to get up to speed on your anatomy, your physiology, and your biomechanics, you can take the classes and then have a project based with mentorship. And that minor would be fantastic for anybody who wants to get into this area. So, yeah. so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Very cool stuff. Is there a sport that you have yet to work with that you really want to work with? You know what I really want to do? I want to do wheelchair basketball at the Parks and Rec in Los Angeles. I want everyone playing wheelchair basketball. <laughs> you want everyone to play it? or you? Yeah. Because what? Because I think it's a really great way of, of playing a sport that you may have played on your own before. Sure. You understand the basic yeah. idea of it, but yeah. it's a whole set of new but challenges. But let's try oh, yeah. it in a wheelchair. Let's, yeah. walk, let's roll a mile in a chair and let's see yeah. what life's like if you have a, uh, some kind of an impairment that limits your mobility. Mm-hmm. So you get an experience of playing basketball but yeah. everyone's in a chair right mm-hmm. and then i think you also meet people who are in a chair most of the day and you now have a whole appreciation it's not about what you can't do it's what you can do mm-hmm. and you get people playing together and when we la 84 which is the foundation for um uh, that came out of the la olympics in 84 that's their thing is play for all yeah. it doesn't matter how old or how young or if you have an impairment that limits mobility get out there and play in some way and play together right mm-hmm. so i think that would be really cool to do. So I'm trying to build relationships to actually make that happen. So oh, cool. Yeah. And Rancho Los Amigos National Rehab Center has a really good wheelchair basketball team, and they're willing to work with me to make that happen. So That's I'm very fantastic. excited about that. We should organize something and get the yeah. engineering students out there. <laughs> that would be fantastic. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Be, and then it's, it, it's just – then you've got human, you've got engineering, and yeah. you have to get the two things working together. It's just really cool. Yeah, I think that'd yeah. be great. I mean, the issue is just getting all the chairs. <laughs> chairs <laughs> and a, um, and a, a trailer, and we can go from each park. And yeah. That'd be fantastic. That'd I'm be so fun. in. <laughs> that'd be, be so fun. cool. That'd, that'd be, be a lot fun. of fun. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the, the last question I have for you is, are you excited about the Olympics coming back to L.A.? Oh yeah, <laughs> and, 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 what's, and given that that's happening, uh, what's on tap? What, because now you, now they're in your, now they're in your backyard. You don't have to Literally. go anywhere. You don't have the carry ons. Yes. So we're working on the slow ramp up for this. We already have a lot of projects. Remember to... the year twenty twenty four? Yeah, twenty twenty eight. Twenty twenty eight. Twenty twenty eight. Yeah, we got yeah. Paris in between there because mm. there was a whole debate, and then there yeah. was I couldn't remember where we landed. So twenty twenty eight. Twenty twenty eight. So we are actually working with many of the organizations that we've had relationships since eighty eight. Um, working with coaches' education, um, figuring out how to 
um, look at mobility in general. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this play for all is a really good way to thinking about how do we build that into our community. And not only just to have places where people play, but have coaches in the places where people play. Mm -hmm. Because that's the guided experiential learning experience. But you can also bring STEM to that. So you have parks all over. Kids can learn about STEM careers through sport. And so we're adding the STEM and sport together in these kind of things that we're putting together. So it's very modular. We make it very easy for who we're connecting with to say yes. Um, and then we can, again, curate what it is that they need and want to do with some of the work that we're doing in the lab. And it's great for the students in the lab because mm -hmm. I've got the high school kids helping out now and the undergrads as well as the graduate students. And uh, so it makes a really nice uh, field experience for everybody that's in the lab. So yeah. I think they're enjoying that, you know, to yeah. go along with hardcore quaternion and math and other <laughs> things that we have to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd want to talk about or that, that we didn't really touch on? We, we covered a lot. Can you think of anything? I, I can't think of anything. That's pretty good. Yeah. We, we, we covered a lot of ground. We did. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that was so great. And, and it's such a pleasure meeting you, like I said. Yeah, I, yep. I, like I said, I've known your name. I've written your name. I've known so many of my students that have worked for you have had yeah. said nothing but great things. So oh, it's a pleasure you. to finally meet you. you. And, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we have to do this again. We have to yeah. check back in when we get back to some other sports. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And that's just about it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for joining us. We release episodes every Monday, so make sure you uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, follow us on SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Spotify now, too, so throw us a follow up there, and we'll see you next week. Peace out and fight on.